Iran has one of the longest histories of any nation on the planet, but most Westerners aren't really aware of that. To the bulk of Americans, Persian or Iranian history starts in the 20th century with the deposition of the Shah and the Iranian Revolution, or to many others, perhaps they're aware of the early spread of Islam to the region, which has certainly created a bit of an identity crisis among the Iranian populace today as they struggle with the erasure of their pre-Islamic history and heritage while resisting the Arabization of their culture. Darius I, Xerxes, Cyrus the Great, all famous Persian leaders who are well known by many different communities in the region. For instance, Cyrus is still revered among the Jewish community for his rather progressive policies of religious tolerance for the time. Darius I greatly expanded the Ottoman Empire in the 5th century BC, while nearly two centuries later, Darius III was the one to lose control of this territory to Alexander of Macedon and his armies. But the most the bulk of Americans associate with the country of Iran today is a hostile Islamic theocracy. We'll get to the conquest and Islamization of Iran later in the video, as before this, the national identity and the borders of what we now know as Iran would be utterly unrecognizable, as some of the earliest peoples in this region were the Sumerians and the Elamites, two groups not known to be related to any other culture on the planet, or the Akkadians, a Semitic people more closely related to Assyrians or more distantly Arabs. Even more interesting, it's even highly believed by many anthropologists, and with good cause, that the Dravidians of southern India actually originated from a group of hunter-gatherer migrants from Iran who trekked down south into the subcontinent some thousands of years ago, and there's actually a substantial amount of genetic evidence for this theory, although there are no confirmed ethno-linguistic relations between them and an outside group. The modern Iranian identity is tied to the migration of some of the first Proto-Indo-European peoples from around the northern Caspian Sea region who had split into the Proto-Indo-Iranians or Aryans and gave rise to the modern Indo-Aryan, Iranian, Dardic, and Nuristani languages and peoples. As I've discussed in past videos, generally speaking, the first proto-religious ideologies and traditions were almost entirely tied to tribal kinship or larger ethno-linguistic affiliation, and accepting another group's religion voluntarily was virtually unheard of on a large scale like what we see today, and the rise of the Abrahamic and Dharmic religions saw a large shift from ethno-religious tribalism to codified religious doctrines. So, for the early Indo-Europeans, their religious beliefs and traditions would have been very closely related initially, but over time, due to dispersion, evolution, and intermingling with different faiths, some of these original Proto-Indo-European religions would have appeared markedly dissimilar to each other. There have been similarities drawn between different old European paganistic religions, with most groupings having very obvious connections and seem to stem from the same source, with clear parallels between Greco-Roman and Norse Germanic folklore and mythology, but there have also been speculations of common roots between the European religions and Hinduism. When it comes to the traditional religion of the Iranians, Zoroastrianism, it's truly unknown where the bulk of their traditions, stories, and ideologies stem from, but sources have been identified as being contemporaneous with other ancient pre-Abrahamic religions of the Middle East, meaning a common origin with Hinduism or European paganism is very much a possibility, although one crucial difference between them is that Zoroastrianism is alternatively described as both a polytheistic and a monotheistic religion, meaning they only believe in one god, or believe in God as more of a pluralistic concept with the dominant deity known as Ahura Mazda, meaning they are essentially henotheistic, meaning they worship one primary deity as opposed to the strictly polytheistic nature for the previous two, although for Hinduism it is a bit more complicated than this. According to Zoroastrian chronology, the faith was founded by the ancient leader known as Zoroaster who is recorded in Zoroastrian texts as training for priesthood since a young age before having a revelation after traveling ancient Iran, and the codified doctrines of Zoroaster soon became popular in the Iranian plateau region by the time of his death, around a millennia before Christ. This extended not only to what we think of as Persia, but also to the Medes, Parthians, Bactrians, and other early Iranic peoples in the area around the Middle East and South Central Asia, even the Armenians at one point, and over hundreds of years, Zoroastrianism grew to become the dominant religion in the Achaemenid Empire, meaning at one point there were millions of adherents of this ancient religion, and this was a crucial part of Iranian identity, culture, and history. 
Zoroastrianism would take a major hit following the conquest of the Achaemenids by Alexander and his Hellenic troops, who did quite a number on many of the Zoroastrian holy sites, including a number of ancient texts and some of the largest of the so-called fire temples. But what exactly is the significance of fire in this religion? To sum up something that I have had very little previous knowledge on, Zoroastrians are not actually fire worshippers, but rather hold fire in high regard as a sign of purity, and in temples and during religious ceremonies, there's almost always at least one fire present, and this has been passed down over the generations as well, as fire is still considered an important aspect of modern Iranian culture and folklore in some ways. And my own mother, of partial Iranian descent, is actually named after the word for fire in the Farsi language. It's debated whether some of the earlier emperors of Persia were active adherents of this religion, but by the time the Persians had recollected as the Sasanian Empire, Zoroastrian theology had once more become the dominant religion of the society, being practiced by every ruler of this empire from beginning to end, although there really was no official religion of the Sasanians, with there being minorities of Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, and other pre-Abrahamic faiths of the Middle East. Some other religious sects in the region also have very clear pre-Abrahamic origins or influences, and it's honestly debatable as to what larger religious belief system they actually fall into, such as the Shabakis, Yarsanis, Alevis, or the Alawite sect, all of whom have varying status of Islamic or non-Islamic, depending on who you talk to, and have quite distinct customs and traditions when compared to the larger surrounding Sunni or Shia populations. In the Ahmadiyya sect of Islam, most popularly found in Pakistan, Zoroaster is given special reverence as a previous messenger from God, despite the Ahmadis not having any particular connection to Iran or Iranian heritage. And although not mentioned in the Quran, Zoroaster is still acknowledged by the bulk of Muslims in and out of Iran as a wise prophet. It's similar to how Christians, Jews, and Muslims all revere the figures of Abraham or Noah and many other figures of the Abrahamic doctrines, yet all have varying views of other central figures such as Jesus or Muhammad. But this brings us to the decline of Zoroastrianism and how they came to be in the position they're in today, which started with a long and bitter rivalry with the predominantly Catholic Byzantine Empire, who shared a border in the Near East Levantine region, and by the time of the 7th century AD, after fighting for decades and exhausting their resources and manpower, both empires were left vulnerable to an invasion they never saw coming. After the death of Muhammad, the Arab Islamic armies would sweep through both of these empires, conquering the bulk of Asian and African territories for the Byzantines, including Israel, Egypt, and the Maghreb, while crushing the entirety of the Sasanian Empire in only 16 years. This created a bit of an identity crisis in these newly acquired territories, as the people were generally neither Arab nor Islamic, although in the case of the former Byzantine region, they may not have been Arabs, but they were fellow Semites in the case of the Syrians, or also belonged to the Afroasiatic families in the cases of the Egyptians and Berbers, which made the gradual transition of Arabization and Islamification go down a lot easier. Not so with Zoroastrian Iran, however. As little-known fact to most Westerners, the Iranian languages are actually more closely related to the languages of Europe than they are to Arabic, although over centuries of rule they had adapted many Arabic loanwords as well as incorporating the Arabic script for the bulk of Iranic languages. The conversion to Islam was not instantaneous in Iran, however, and similarly to Egypt, it was likely many centuries before the bulk of the populace actually shifted over to Islam, and the Islamic authorities had a surprisingly high amount of tolerance for the Zoroastrian religion initially. The assimilation of much of the local Zoroastrian practices, the tolerance of their pre-Islamic fables, and even the acceptance of their most significant and revered figure, Zoroaster, among the mainstream population, shows that similarly to Europe, where local priests had to incorporate elements of European paganism in order to make Christianity more appealing, the same was done in Iran in respect to their traditional faith of Zoroastrianism. Now, it would shock many to discover that the bulk of the Zoroastrian community worldwide today is actually in India of all places, as following the Islamic invasion, a small number of Iranians fleeing religious persecution arrived in the Indian subcontinent a century or two after their subjugation. This is a shockingly similar situation to that of the Jews, ethnologically speaking, as although many Zoroastrian men initially married local Indian women, similar to how Jewish men initially married European women, over time, after the community was established, they practiced a strict code of endogamy, 
meaning marriage to those outside of the religious group was virtually unheard of for most of their history. For this reason, the Zoroastrians of South Asia are acknowledged as being of foreign stock, with their ethnonym Parsi or Irani literally deriving directly from the words Persian and Iranian, and today they are still very much distinguishable from the general Indian populace, being roughly 20 to 40 percent South Asian genetically, while the rest of their DNA is from the original Iranian migrants. Similarly to any small, isolated community, with only around 100,000 Zoroastrians estimated worldwide, certain problems have arisen among this group, including an extremely low fertility rate, as finding a compatible partner for marriage is becoming increasingly difficult, genetic depression from inbreeding, as well as a steeply falling population. Shockingly, nearly a third of the South Asian Parsi community has emigrated from the region in the past few decades, greatly reducing the cohesion of this already highly fragmented community, with the largest diaspora centers being halfway around the world, mostly in the U.S., but also in other parts of the Anglosphere as well, such as the U.K. or Canada. However, similarly to the Jews, despite their small numbers, the Zoroastrians have distinguished themselves as one of the most successful, wealthy, and influential ethnic groups in all of South Asia and around the world. In India, Parsis are by far the most wealthy, literate, longest living, and successful group by merely all metrics, with perhaps the exception of marriage and fertility, and in terms of politics, media, and culture, perhaps no other people group is more overrepresented than the Zoroastrians in both India and many other countries, with even a tiny Zoroastrian minority, as even in Pakistan, a country where they number only a few thousand, they've managed to climb their way to the elite of the society. So in conclusion, the Zoroastrians, or Parsis, have certainly evolved over the centuries, becoming outcasts in their own homelands, to becoming wealthy beyond their ancestors' wildest dreams. So please let me know your thoughts on the Zoroastrians and their religion, and for today's poll, tell me which other smaller religious group you would like to see a spotlight on in the future. And as always, this has been Mason, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.